by J.R. Planchet, The Vampire, or The Bride of the Isles. Introductory Vision The curtain rises to slow music and discovers the interior of the basaltic caverns of Staffa, at the extremity of which is a chasm opening to the air. The moonlight streams through it and partially reveals a number of rude sepulchres. On one of these, right second entrance, Lady Margaret is seen stretched in a heavy slumber. The spirit of the flood rises through the ground, center, to the symphony of the following incantation. Spirit, spirit of the air, hear and heed my spell of power, on the night breeze swift repair, hither from thy starry bower. Appear, appear, by the sun that hath set, in the waves I love, by the spheres that have met in the heavens above, by the latest dews that fall to earth, on the eve that renews the fair moon's birth. Appear, appear, by the charm of might and the word of fear, which must never be breathed to mortal ear. Spirit, spirit of the air, Hither at my call, repair. Music. The spirit of the air descends through the chasm on a silvery cloud, which she leaves and advances, left. Why? How now, sister? Wherefore am I summoned? What in the deep and fearful caves of Staffa demands our presence or protection? Speak. Spirit of the air. Thy sister Unda claims thy powerful aid. Not idly from thy blue and star-illumined mansion art thou called to Fingal's rocky sepulchre. Look here. Pointing to Lady Margaret, right. A maiden and asleep. Attend thee, Ariel. Her name is Margaret, the only daughter of Ronald, the brave baron of the isles. A richer, lovelier, more virtuous lady this land of flood and mountains never boasted. Tomorrow Marsden's earl will claim her hand, renowned through Europe for his large possessions, his clerky knowledge, and his deeds of arms. How came she in this den of death and horror? Chasing the red deer with her father, Ronald, a storm arose, and, parted from her train, she sought a shelter here. Calmly she sleeps, nor dreams tomorrow's hymeneal rites will give her beauties to a vampire's arms. A vampire, sayst thou? Is then Marsden's all? Thou knowest, Ariel, that wicked souls are for wise purposes permitted off to enter the dead forms of other men, assume their speech, their habits, and their knowledge, and thus roam o'er the earth, but subject still, at stated periods, to a dreadful tribute. Ay, they must wed some fair and virtuous maiden, whom they do after kill, and from her veins drain eagerly the purple stream of life, which horrid draught alone hath power to save them from swift extermination. Yes, that state of nothingness, total annihilation, the most tremendous punishment of heaven. Their torture then being without resource, they do enjoy all power in the present. Death binds them not. From form to form they fleet, and though the cheek be pale and glazed the eye, such is their wondrous art, the hapless victim blindly adores and drops into their grasp, like birds when gazed on by the basilisk. Say on. Beneath this stone the relics lie of Cromel, called the Bloody. Staffa still his reign of fear remembers. For his crimes his spirit roams, a vampire in the form of Marsden's Earl. To count his victims o'er would be an endless task. Suffice to say, his race of terror will tomorrow end. Unless he wins some virgin for his prey, ere sets the full-orbed moon. And with this view, 
he weds the Lady Margaret. Ay, Ariel, unless our blended art can save the maid. What can be done? Our power is limited. What can be done, my sister? We must warn the maiden of her fate. Lend me thine aid to raise a vision to her sleeping sight. Let us about it. They perform magical ceremonies to the symphony of the following charm. Phantom, from, from thy tomb so drear, at our bidding swift arise. Let thy vampire corpse appear to the sleeping maiden's eyes. Come, come away, come, come away, away, that the form she may know that would work her woe and shun thee, till the setting ray of the moon shall bid thy power decay. Phantom, from thy tomb so drear, at our bidding, rise, appear. Thunder. Appear, appear, appear. The vampire rises from the tomb of Cromel and springs toward Margaret. Margaret! Foul spirit, retire! She is mine! The hour is not yet come. Down, thou foul spirit! Extermination waits thee! Down, I say! Music. The vampire, shuddering sinks again into the tomb, and the scene closes. Act One, Scene One A hall in the castle of Lord Ronald. McSwell, center, and a group of retainers in hunting dresses, discovered, seating round a table drinking. The sun is seen just rising behind the hills through the large Gothic windows at the back. Come, feel at the parting, glass go round with a stirrup cup, be our reverie crowned. See the sun that set to our bugle sound, is changing the night in the morning. As darkness shrinks from his rising grace, so sorrow and care we will keep at bay by the bowl at night in the hark away that awakes his brave boys in the morning. They all rise. McSwill hides under the table. Bridget, calling without. McSwill? Enter Bridget and Robert, left. Very pretty doings, upon my word. He is our poor mistress, the Lady Margaret, been lost for nearly the whole night in the forest, and no sooner is she by good fortune found again, and trying to get a little rest in her own apartments, but you make all this noise, as if on purpose to disturb her. Nay, Mrs. Bridget, don't be angry with them. They've been celebrating my lady's return. Return? Don't tell me. They never want an excuse to get drunk. Out of the castle directly. Don't stand talking and scraping there. Go along directly when I tell you. Exeunt retainers left. Oh, where's that rascal McSwill? He's at the bottom of all this. But if I... McSwill attempts to steal off left. Ah, uh, oh, there you are, sir. Come here, sir. Seizes him by the ear and brings him forward. Down on your knees directly and ask my pardon. Ah, oh, dear Mrs. Bridget. How came you under the table? What a question when a man has been drinking all night. Will you never leave off taking your drops? I don't take drops, Mrs. Bridget. Here has poor Robert been running through the forest all night, seeking my lady, and peeping into all the holes of the grotto, whilst you... The... the grotto, Mrs. Bridget. To Robert. Good guide us. Why, you didn't go into the grotto, did you? And why not, booby? Oh dear, oh dear, the ignorance of some people. But you are an Englishman, and that accounts for it. Why... Didn't you know that the grotto was haunted? <laughs> aye, aye, laugh away, do. But I can tell you it's full of kelpies and evil spirits of all sorts. Only ask Mrs. Bridget. It's very true, Robert. And you shouldn't laugh, for they always owe a grudge to anybody that jests about them. Did you never hear the story of Lady Blanche? Hush, don't talk so loud. You know it, Mrs. Bridget. No, 
but Lord Ronald is very angry with everybody who circulates stories of that description. So speak lower if you are going to tell it. Well then, once upon a time... <laughs> Mother Bunch's fairy tales. Well, isn't that the proper way to begin a story? Go on. Once upon a time... You've said that once, twice. Will you be quiet with your fun? I won't tell it at all. Well, well then, once upon a time, what happened? Once upon a time, there lived a lady named Blanche in this very castle, and she was betrothed to a rich Scotch nobleman. All the preparations for the wedding were finished, when, on the evening before it was to take place, the lover strolled into the forest. Alone? No, together, to be sure. Well, Sot, I mean that, and I think it was highly improper. Well, they were seen to enter the grotto, and... And what? They never came out again. Bravo! An excellent story. But that isn't all. The next morning the body of the lady was found covered with blood, and the marks of human teeth on her throat, but no trace of the nobleman could be discovered. And from that time to this, he has never been heard of. They do say, oh, I hope nobody hears us, they do say that the nobleman was a vampire, for a friar afterwards confessed on his deathbed that he had privately married them in the morning by the nobleman's request, and that he fully believed it was some fiend incarnate, for he could not say the responses without stuttering. Better and better. And how came you by this precious legend? Great uncle of my grandfather had it from the great grandfather of the steward's cousin by the mother's side who lived with the branch of the family when the accident happened. And moreover, I've heard my great uncle say that these horrible spirits called vampires kill and suck the blood of beautiful young maidens whom they are obliged to marry before they can destroy. And they do say that such is the condition of their existence, that if, at stated periods, they should fail to obtain a virgin bride whose lifeblood may sustain them, they would instantly perish. Oh, the beautiful young maidens. Of beautiful young maidens? Merciful powers! What an escape I've had! I was in the cavern myself one day. Lord, Mrs. Bridget, I'm sure there's no occasion for you to be frightened. Why, you saucy sot, I have a great mind to... A bell rings, right. I declare tis my lady's bell. No occasion indeed, an impudent fellow. But men nowadays have no more manners than hogs. Bell rings again. Exit Mrs. Bridget, right. There's a shade devil for you. Oh, I don't think there's such another vixen in all Scotland. She's little and hot like a peppercorn. What a lug she gave me by the ear. Ugh. Nay, nay, you mustn't mind that. All old ladies have their odd ways. Care such odd ways as that, though. I shall feel the pinch for a month. Pray, Mr. Robert, as you have been in London with Lord Ronald, do you know who this earl is that the Lady Margaret is to be married to? I only know that he is the Earl of Marsden and master of the castle on the coast facing this island. What? Where the pretty Effie, your intended, lives? Exactly. He'll arrive just in time, then, to be present at the wedding. I hope so. <sighs> that will be glorious. Two weddings in one day. Such dancing, such eating, such <laughs> drinking. Bridget? Calling without, right. Mix will. <sighs> Choke you, you old warlock. What's in the wind now, I wonder? Crosses to right. Bridget, calling without, right. Mix will, I say. Coming, Mrs. Bridget. Exit McSwill, right. Yes, as soon as the Earl arrives, I shall certainly take an opportunity to request him to honour the wedding with his presence. How pleased my dear Effie would be! Charming girl! 
I shall never forget the hour when first we met. The hour when first we met, my dear, The hour when first we met, I never can forget, my dear, I never can forget. So sweet on me those eyes were turned That beamed thy cheek above, they looked like lamps that only burned To light the heart to love. To light the heart to love, my dear, To light the heart to love. They looked like lamps that only burned To light the heart to love. And while they shine on me, my dear, And while they shine on me, I'll ne'er be false to thee, my dear, I'll ne'er be false to thee. Oh, never, never slight me then, Nor leave me love to say. Like fires that glimmer o'er the fen, They beam but to betray. They beam but to betray, my dear, They beam but to betray. Like fires that glimmer o'er the fen, They beam but to betray. Exit Robert, left. Scene 2. An apartment in the castle. Enter Lady Margaret and Bridget, right. Oh, my lady, you must tell, not me. I'm sure the fright and the fatigue you have undergone have made you ill. Indeed, no. I feel quite recovered, I assure you, my good Bridget. But I know better, my lady. That smile is not like your usual ones. Something ails you. Something certainly troubles me, but my health is not affected. I would confide the cause of my uneasiness to you, but fear you will laugh at me when I tell you. It is a dream I have had. A dream? For heaven's sake, tell me, my lady. A horrible one, Bridget. Last night, as I was endeavouring to join the hunters from whom, in the hurry of the chase, I had been separated, I wandered near the famous basaltic caverns to which the vulgar attached so many strange traditions. The storm grew violent. By the strong flashes of lightning I discovered the opening of the grotto. I entered it for shelter and, overcome with fatigue, fell asleep upon one of the rocky tombs. On a sudden a sepulchre opened and a phantom approached me. I trembled, but an invisible hand seemed to prevent my flight. I could not even turn mine eyes from the apparition. To my surprise, the countenance was that of a young and handsome man, but it was pale and well-worn. His eyes, fixed upon mine with the most touching expression, seemed to implore my pity. He uttered my name and had nearly reached me when a beautiful being stood between us and checked his progress. Then, oh horror! The features of the spectre grew frightfully distorted, its whole form assumed the most terrific appearance, and it sunk into the tomb from which it had issued, with a shriek that froze me. Mercy preserve us! I tremble all over! I awoke. The moon streamed into the grotto, and I sprung into the open air. I heard the voices of those who sought me. I answered them as loudly as I was able. With shouts of joy they surrounded me and bore me safely hither. I shall never sleep in peace again, oh, my dear young lady. Ronald, without. My daughter risen, you say. But here comes your father. Shall you tell him, my lady? Oh, no. He is such an enemy to what he calls superstition that I dare not expose myself to his ridicule. Enter Lord Ronald. Left. Well, my dear daughter, what, up and dressed again already? Come, this is a happy omen. Bridget, order my henchmen to the turrets of the keep, and give notice of the Earl of Marsden's approach. 
crosses, and exit Bridget. This day, my dear Margaret, will be one of the happiest of my life. But what's the matter? You appear sorrowful. Ah, uh, my dear father, the description we have had of Marston has been such certainly as should prejudice us in his favor. Yet the nearer the moment approaches of his arrival, the more I feel uneasy. Oh, sir, my fate is next to heaven in your hands. Do not, do not make your daughter miserable. Why this agitation, Margaret? I have never wished to force your inclination. I certainly desire his alliance most ardently. Nevertheless, if you dislike him— I do not know that I shall. But you, sir, who wish me to accept him, do not know him personally. Tis true, but if he resembles his brother, you cannot fail to love him. Alas, poor Ruthven. You never mention his name but with a sigh. Is it possible I can ever cease to lament so dear a friend? I have heard you say he saved your life, and for that reason I revere his memory myself. But are you sure he no longer exists? Would that I could harbor a doubt on the subject, but alas, the fatal scene of his death is ever present to my imagination. When called, as you know, by the sudden illness of my now late son to Athens, I found Lord Ruthven, with whom he had contracted an intimacy, hanging over his sick couch and bestowing on him the attentions of a brother. Such behavior naturally endeared him to me, and after my poor boy's death, his lordship being, like myself, an enthusiastic admirer of the beauties of nature and the works of art, became the constant companion of my excursions. The more I saw of him, the more I admired his extraordinary talents. In my eyes, he appeared something more than human, and seemed destined to fill that place in my affections, which had become void by my son's decease. I showed him your miniature. Never shall I forget the emotion in beholding it. By heavens, he exclaimed. "'Tis the precise image my fancy has created as the only being who could ever constitute my happiness. We were on the point of returning to Scotland to learn your sentiments on the subject, when one evening—' But why should I inflict you with the repetition of so dreadful a story? "'Pray proceed, sir. I sympathize in your afflictions and feel a melancholy gratification in contemplating the devotedness and heroism which preserve to me so dear a father.' Returning to Athens, then, one evening, after a short excursion, we were attacked by some banditti. I was disarmed. Ruthven threw himself before me and received the ruffian's saber in his own breast. Our attendants, however, succeeded in overcoming the villains. I threw myself into the arms of my expiring friend. He pressed my hand. Lord Ronald, said he, I have saved your life. I die content. My only regret is that fate has prevented me from becoming your son. Gallant, unfortunate Ruthven, what a destiny was thine to fall in a foreign land in the flower of thy youth, deprived of sepulchre. How deprived of sepulchre? An extraordinary circumstance prevented my fulfilling that last melancholy duty. In his dying agonies, he conjured me to quit the spot, lest the assassins should return in number. The moon was rising in unclouded majesty. Place me, said he, on yonder mound, so that my fleeting spirit may be soothed by the soft and tranquil light of yon chaste luminary. I did so. He expired. I left the body to collect our servants, who were in pursuit of the defeated villains, and ere we could return to the spot, it had disappeared. Removed for plunder, doubtless. I ne'er could ascertain. The stains of the grass sufficiently marked the spot where I had lain him, but all search was in vain. On quitting Greece, I heard Lord Marsden was in Venice. To him I sent his brother's property, and amidst it he found your picture, which, in my desire for his alliance, I had given Ruthven. The Earl proposed immediately to replace the loss we had sustained in his brother, and nothing, I am confident, remains to complete our happiness but his arrival. Why is not Ruthven living? Methinks I could have loved him for his preservation of you. Bugle and response. Left. Re-enter Bridget. Left. The Earl has arrived, my lord. Come, Margaret, let us haste and receive him. My dear sir, I cannot see him yet. Indeed, I cannot. Retire, then, for a while to your apartment. Bridget, attend your lady. Exeunt Margaret and Bridget, right. Enter four servants left, who range across the back. I'll fly to meet the Earl. Ha! He is here. 
Enter Lord Riven, left. My lord, the honor you've done me. Heavens, what do I see? Do I recall the memory of a friend, Lord Ronald? His voice, too. Ruthven! Such was my name, till the death of an elder brother put me in possession of my present title. Can I believe my senses? Or does some vision mock my waking sight? My dear friend, let this embrace banish your doubts. Ruthven, my friend, but by what miracle have you been preserved to me? Unexpected but powerful assistance recalled my fleeting spirit. When sufficiently recovered to join you, you had quitted Greece. The news of my brother's death reached me. I wrote to you under my new title, and, arriving in Scotland to take possession of my paternal estate, determined to give you this pleasurable surprise. Oh, happy hour! I once more embrace my friend. Be sure, Ruthven, that my daughter would only have become your brother's bride to acquit me of the debt that I owe you. My generous friend! But think you I shall be fortunate enough to gain the lovely Margaret's affections? I cannot doubt it. She has pitied your misfortunes. She has wept over your fate. She comes. Exeunt attendants. Left. What will be her astonishment? Re-enter Lady Margaret. Right. My dear, behold the generous friend whose loss we have so long deplored. Tis Ruthven claims your hand. My lord, duty to a beloved parent will... She raises her eyes slowly to his countenance, starts and falls with a shriek into the arms of Lord Ronald. No! Ah! Margaret, oh heavens, she is ill. Help there. Lady Margaret, shuddering and aside. That countenance, the phantom of last night. Relapses into insensibility. What can have occasioned of this emotion? Alas, I know not. Margaret, my sweet child. Lady Margaret, reviving. Pardon, my lord, this weakness, the effect of last night's adventure. Last night? We hunted late yesterday. My daughter lost her way and suffered much fatigue. Beautiful Lady Margaret, how am I to interpret this emotion? The surprise of seeing one whose death we were even now deploring. Is it possible that, without knowing me, the recital of my misfortunes alone could thus have interested you? I am the daughter of Lord Ronald, and my heart, touched with gratitude. Aside. I dare not look at him. With gratitude? And what will be my gratitude, if you but deign to approve your father's generous designs? Crossing to her. Tell me. Or oh, tell me, you confirm them, or oh, never, never will I rise from your feet. Kneeling and seizing her hand, Lady Margaret aside. Heavens, how strange a thrill runs through my frame. Riven aside. Then she's mine. These transports, my lord, must not alarm you. It is in the presence of your father. It is at his desire I hear vow my eternal fidelity. Oh, my friend, join your supplications to mine. My daughter is well aware of my wishes. Speak, dearest lady, I conjure you. Lady Margaret, aside. What spell is it that moves me thus? Aloud. My lord, my father has never yet found me disobedient to his will. You consent, then? Lady Margaret to Lord Ronald. My dear sir, allow me to retire. Lady, dear lady. Pardon me, my lord. A strange confusion, a wild emotion overpowers me. Let me retire. Exit Lady Margaret, right. Ruthven, the wish of my heart is gratified. You are my son. Dearest sir, I have still a boon to ask. Let our marriage be celebrated without delay. It is my intention, and tomorrow... Good night, my friend. Business of the utmost importance recalls me to London. Tomorrow's dawn must witness our departure. Impossible. Have you not to take possession of your estate? 
It is but showing myself at the castle, from which I can return ere the sun sets this evening. Well, if my daughter makes no objections, I will go, plead your suit, and hear the reasons for your haste afterwards. I know not how you have infatuated me, Ruthven, but rest assured, I feel for you all that a father's heart can feel. Exit Ronald, left. Revan, walking about, agitated. Demon as I am, that walk the earth to slaughter and devour, the little that remains of my heart within this wizard frame, sustained alone by human blood, shrieks from the appalling act of planting misery in the bosom of this veteran chieftain. Still must the fearful sacrifice be made, and suddenly, for the approaching night will find my wretched frame exhausted, and darkness worse than death, annihilation is my lot. Margaret, unhappy maid, thou art my destined prey. Thy blood must feed a vampire's life, and prove the food of his disgusting banquet. Enter Robert, timidly, left. My lord? What would you? I beg your lordship's pardon for my boldness, but I am a servant of Lord Ronald's, and would fain request your lordship's patronage. In what respect? I am betrothed, and please your lordship, to Effie, your steward's daughter. And, as I hear it is your lordship's intention to visit your estate, I... Betrothed, say you? Yes, my lord. And when is the marriage to take place? This evening, my lord. Riffin, half aside. I will be there. Oh, my lord, I was afraid to ask you. But your lordship has made me so happy. What distance are we from the castle? The sea is calm, my lord. We may row there in a few minutes. Order the barge instantly, then. Yes, my lord. Exit Robert, left. Enter Lord Ronald, left. All is arranged to your wishes. Your daughter consents? She does, and I have ordered the chapel to be prepared for our return. You go to Mosden with me, then? Certainly. Your stay is so short, I will not leave you for a moment. My dear friend, this kindness. Re-enter Robert, left. The barge is ready, my lord. Away! Away! Hurried music. Exeunt. Left. Scene 3. Garden of Lord Riven's Castle. The Sea in the Distance. Andrew and Effie discovered, right, surrounded by village lads and lasses, dressed as for a fete. What can be the reason Robert does not arrive? Something has happened to detain him. He will be here soon. I see nothing like a boat at present. Andrew, looking off, left upper entrance. Why, what is that to the right there? Not a boat, I'm sure, father. But I say it is a boat, and making for the castle too. Hark, father, hark! A boat is seen at sea, which gradually approaches, to the symphony of the following boat song, sung without left, and growing louder and louder as the boat nears the land. Row on, row on across the main, so smoothly glides our bark to shore, while to our boat song's measured strain so truly dips the well-time door. Run, run in yonder isle, impatient beauty chides us, say, the headland past her sweetest smile, our labor richly will repay. See, to see his form, I see for soon he will be here. The neighbors 
Let's haste prepare the feast, the bonding plant to cheer. For there's nay luck about the host, there's nay luck at all. There's little pleasure in the host. When my dear lads away, there's nay luck about the host, there's nay luck at all. There's little pleasure in the host. When Robert's far away. Shouts without, left upper entrance. Enter Robert, left upper entrance. My dear Robert. My sweet Effie. What has kept you so long? Oh, I've news for you. Lord Ronald has come with me, and who do you think besides, father-in-law? Nay, I'm sure I can't guess. Lord Ruthen. Lord Riven. Why, he has been dead these twelve months. Has he? I believe you're mistaken, father-in-law. Shouts, left of center. Do you hear that? Foe, foe, I tell you it must be some impostor. Enter Riven, Ronald, and attendants. Left upper entrance. <gasps> Merciful providence, it is my young master. Yes, my good Andrew, behold me restored to you. Thank heaven, thank heaven. But I could not believe that I should ever have the pleasure of seeing my dear master again. I shall never forget your attachment to our family, and your attention to their interest. Let me not interrupt your felicity. You are about to celebrate a marriage, I think. Yes, my lord. Here's my daughter, Effie, whom your lordship remembers a little girl. She's very pretty. Yes, my lord. That is, thank you, my lord. You must allow me to give the bride her dowry, and patronize the whole ceremony. Oh, my lord, this is such an honor. Well, then, before the dance commences, neighbors, let us go and arrange the supper-table where we will drink our good lord's happy return. Away with you, then. Exeunt Andrew, left, and peasants. Right upper entrance. I must leave you for a moment, Ruthven, to give some directions to my bargeman. Exit Ronald and attendants, left upper entrance. Come, Effie, let's follow our neighbors. Going. Riven, left, detaining Effie. Fair Effie, I would speak with you. Effie, with hesitation, center. If Robert has no objection, my lord. How, you silly girl, when his lordship does you so much honour? You'll find me with Andrew. Exit Robert, right. Come nearer, charming maid. My lord, I... I dare not, my lord. Fear nothing. Aside. Yet she has cause to fear. Should I surprise her heart, as by my gifted spell I may, the tribute that prolongs existence may be paid, and Margaret may, at least a while, be spared. To Effie. How delightful tis to gaze upon thee thus! An atmosphere of joy is round about thee, which whosoever breathes becomes thy slave. My lord, what mean you? My heart ne'er throbbed but for one woman, and you have just her features. This morning the flame of love was extinguished in my soul. But now, now it burns with redoubled ardor. But the lady whom you admired, my lord. She is dead. Dead? Yes, dead, Effie. But in you she lives again. What do I hear? Oh, Effie. Can you not conceive the happiness of once more beholding the object we adore? I shall never love any one but Robert. Happy Robert, and unfortunate Riven. Why did I ever behold thee, Effie? See me no more, my lord, if that has occasioned your uneasiness. Going, right. Stay, Effie. It is in your power to console me for all I have lost. Love me. Nay, start not. Mine you must and shall be. 
My lord, I'll hear no more. If Robert... Think not of him. The bridal preparations are complete. My bride thou art. No power on earth shall tear thee from me. Say, Effie, that you love me. Taking her hand. <laughs> Mercy on me! Oh, my lord, I... I know not what to say. My heart beats so fast that... Oh, pray, leave me, my lord. Sobbing. You weep. Those tears are for me. No, no, indeed, my lord. This instant let me bear thee to the priest. My lord, for pity's sake. You plead in vain. Effie, thou art mine forever. Bears her off, right. Re-enter Robert, right upper entrance. How long she stays? Not here. Why? Effie shrieks. Heavens, what do I see? Born off and struggling. Villain, loose your hold. Draws a pistol and runs after them. Right. Stage gradually darkens. Enter Andrew and Lord Ronald. Right upper entrance. Why, Andrew, said you not the Earl was here? "'Twas here I left him, but just now, my lord. A pistol fired without right. Effie shrieks without right. Oh, save me! Save me! Oh, my daughter's voice! Exit right. Enter Lord Riven, wounded, right upper entrance. Ruthven! Riven, falling, center. I die! What murderous hand? The moon is seen descending. Exclaim not. I have but a moment to live. Ronald, swear by the host of heaven to obey my last commands. Young man, the word of Ronald needs no oath to bind it. I die. Delay not a moment, but swear to— I do, I do. I swear by all that is most dear and sacred to honor and to man to fulfill your last desire. Conceal my death from every human being till yonder moon, which now sails in her full splendor, shall be set this night, and ere an hour shall elapse after I have expired. Throw this ring into the waves that wash the tomb of Fingal. Gives a ring. I will, I will, Ruthven, dear Ruthven. Remember your oath. The lamp of night is descending the blue heavens. When I am dead, let its sweet light shine on me. Farewell. Remember, remember your oath. Dies. Solemn music. Ronald lays the body of Riven on a bank in the garden, right upper entrance, and kneels mournfully beside it. The moon continues descending till the light falls full upon the corpse. Ronald rises, crosses to left, and the curtain drops. Act Two, Scene One, The Tomb of Fingal, right of center, and the caverns of Staffa, the sea, moonlight, music. Enter Andrew, Robert, and Effie in a boat, left upper entrance. They land. Here, Robert! You may rest concealed till Lord Ronald's anger shall have subsided. Or should he be deaf to explanation and refuse to believe Lord Riven's treachery, arrangements shall be made to convey you over to the mainland. Here is sufficient provision for the short time I hope you will be forced to remain. And so now, bid Effie goodbye for a while. I'll look out in the meantime and see if the coast be clear for our return. Exit Andrew in the boat, left upper entrance. Come, cheer up, Effie. All will be well yet. It was in defense of innocence I fired, and therefore that act will never be a load on my conscience. But if Lord Ronald should get you into his power? I will put it to Lord Ronald's self to say whether a man should stand tamely by and see the wife of his bosom dragged to misery and dishonour. 
Come, kiss me, Effie, and farewell till better times. Though vanished be the visions fair, by fancy's pencil traced, and blighted all the blossoms rare that hope's gay chaplet graced. Fear not, my faith, the pang of death alone can bid it flee. Then fare thee well, my only love. Fare thee well, my only love. Fare thee well, my only love. Thou art more than life to me. Fare thee well, my only love. Fare thee well, my only love. Though clouded now the prospect seen, the grief you simply a light may break. A ray may be, and joy resume its path. Enter Andrew in the boat, left upper entrance. Fear not my faith, the pang of death alone can bid it flee. Then fare thee well, my only love. Fare thee well, my only love. Fare thee well, my only love. Thou art more than life to me. Fare thee well, my only love. Fare thee well, my only love. Andrew places Effie in the boat, and exit, left upper entrance. And now to find some hole for a bedchamber. Rather sorry accommodations, I fancy. But the superstitions of the peasantry will keep them from disturbing my repose. And as to other considerations, a man with a clear conscience may rest anywhere. Looking. Here's tolerable choice of apartments as far as number goes. Let me try what shelter this will afford. Exit into the cavern. Right. Music. A boat is seen. Left upper entrance, with Lord Ronald and two attendants in it. Enter Lord Ronald from the boat. Give me the torch, and wait without the cave till you see me wave it thus. Exeunt attendants in the boat, left. How solemn is this scene. Places the torch in a fissure of the rock, left second entrance. By heaven, my soul that lately mocked at superstition, is so subdued by circumstance that I could almost bring myself to give faith to every legend I have scorned as idle. Here is the ring. What am I about to do? What horrible suspicion flashes across my brain? Ruthven, mysterious being, what mean these ceremonies? Before, when I supposed him dying, he bade me place his body in the light of the moon, and now again. And wherefore make me swear to conceal his death till the moon be set? But let me not reflect or pause. Unhappy Ruthven, thy friend performs his promise. Throws the ring into the water, center. A peal of thunder is heard, after which the voice of Riven. Remember your oath. It is his spirit speaks. Ruthven, my friend, my preserver. Re-enter Robert, right. What voice was that? Lord Ronald? Ha! 
By heaven, justice hath given the murderer to my vengeance. Draws. Ruthven, this sacrifice I make to thee. Hear me, my lord. Lord Reuven would have wronged me. Wouldst thou asperse the dead? Down, villain, down! Attacks him. Nay, in my own defence, then... They fight. Robert is disarmed. Ronald plunges him into the waves, right upper entrance. Lord Ronald rushes to the entrance of the cavern and waves the torch. The boat approaches. Ruthven, thou art revenged. Away! Away! Ronald leaps into the boat, left upper entrance. Robert reaches and clings to the rocks, right, and the scene closes. Scene 2. An apartment in Lord Ronald's castle. Enter Lady Margaret, meeting Bridget, right. Bridget, I was looking for you. I am so happy. Happy, my lady, and Lord Riven and your father not returned. I'm frightened out of my wits about them. Tis ten o'clock, and they were to have been back again ere sunset. You may dispel your fears, then. Lord Ruthven has this moment announced to me my father's return. Lord Riven? On opening the casement just now that looks into the garden, I saw him by the moonlight crossing one of the walks. I called to him, and he will be here directly, that the ceremony may commence. We must depart for London ere daybreak. So soon? Yes, he has explained the reason to me. The King of England wishes him to marry a lady of the court, and he has no other way of avoiding the match but by presenting me immediately as his wife. And here comes your father, I declare. Well, my lady, I'll away and see that everything is ready. Exit Bridget, right. I can hardly account for my sudden attachment to Lord Ruthven, especially after the shock his introduction gave me. Enter Lord Ronald, left. Well, sir, is Ruthven coming? Ruthven, alas. You sigh. What troubles you, my dear father? Nothing. Aside. What shall I say to her? Everything is prepared for the ceremony. Lord Ruthven has doubtless informed you of the pressing reason he asks for our immediate departure. Its suddenness at first alarmed me, but if you will accompany us, what a charming voyage! You do not listen to me. Why, father, what's the matter? My dear Margaret, we must think no more of this union. Think no more of it? Have you not been yourself the cause? And do you now— Question me not. I cannot answer you. Good heavens! And Ruthven, who, not a moment ago, so warmly urged— Ronald, starting. Ruthven, not a moment ago. What mean you? You frighten me. But Ruthven will soon be here, and— Enter Lord Riven, behind, left upper entrance. Ruthven is— Starting, left. Can the grave give up its dead? Spirit, what wouldst thou? Riven, apart to Ronald. Remember your oath. Ronald, my friend, what means this wildness? My brain turns round. I saw him fall. I heard his dying groan. Fiend, phantom, hence I charge thee. Alas, he raves. Lady Margaret, clinging to Riven, right. My father, my poor father. Ronald crosses to her. Touch him not, Margaret. Flee the demon's grasp. How dreadful is its wildness! Oh, within there! I am not mad. Ruthven's dead. I saw... Riven, aside, left. Your oath. Enter two servants, left. Your master is not well. His brain is wandering. Secure him, and let aid be sent for instantly. Servants take hold of Ronald, center. Stand off, slaves. Tis a fiend in human shape. I saw him perish. Twice have I seen him perish. As I have life, heaven saw and heard. Riven, aside. Your oath. Lady Margaret, to the servants. Oh, harm him not, but lead him gently in. That dreadful oath. Servants seize him. 
Stay but a moment. Margaret, promise me you will not marry till the moon shall set. Then, fearful fiend, I am no longer pledged and may preserve my child. Oh, my poor father! Falls into the arms of Riven, fainting. Remove him gently, suddenly, I say. No, I will not quit my child an instant. Horror overwhelms me. I know not what thou art, but terrible conviction flashes on my mind that thou art nothing human. A mist seems clearing from my sight, and I behold thee now. Oh, horror, horror, a monster of the grave. Uh, uh, vamp. Falls into his servant's arms, who bear him off, right. Remember. Aside. She's mine. My prey is in my clutch. The choicest crowning victim. Ah, oh, revive my bride. Where am I? Where, where is my father? In safety, love, be sure. Retired to his chamber. I know not what to think. Alas, I have seen him often thus during our travels together. His reason received a severe shock on the death of my young friend, your brother. Is it possible? I never knew him thus. Rely upon the melancholy truth, but will not last. So cheer thee, lovely Margaret. Alas, I need your consolation. How wild a fancy seized him that you were dead, and his request too not to marry until the moon had set. Well, I will not. Riven aside. Ah. Aloud. Sweet Margaret, you will not sure repent. Why, my good lord, so short a delay cannot be of consequence, and twill appease him, probably, and such a slight request. I reverence your motive, but if you love me, Margaret— You cannot doubt it. Upon that love, then, my repose, my happiness, my life depends. Swear to me, dearest Margaret, to forget these idle terrors, and to be mine. Mine only, for ever. I do, by him who reads all hearts, to be thine and thine only, for ever. Oh, happiness, receive this ring, and let it be a sacred pledge between us. Kisses the ring, and places it on her finger. Ha! Huh. Riven, aside, smiling. Her fate is sealed. She cannot now retract. Aloud. You shudder. What ails my love? A strange sensation runs throughout my frame. Tears fill my eyes, and my heart beats as though twould burst my bosom. Methinks my father's voice still rings in my ears. Wed not before the moon shall set. Riven, aside. The hour approaches. No time is to be lost. Aloud. Think no more, I beseech thee, of these wanderings of the imagination, but let us hasten to consecrate the ties which unite us. Every arrangement must, by this time, have been made. Retire, my love, to your chamber, compose your spirits, and Riven will then lead thee to the altar. Music. Exeunt Riven and Lady Margaret Wright. Scene 3. Distant view of Lord Ronald's castle by moonlight. Enter Andrew and Effie left, supporting Robert. Nay, nay, do not trouble yourselves. I have sustained no injury. But what made you come back to me so soon? We saw the boat pass with Lord Ronald in it, and we feared some mischief. So we lay to till he left the cavern, and returned just in time to render you assistance. Yonder is the castle. Are you still determined to seek him? Yes, he has been imposed upon, and ere now, I am sure, he regrets having drawn upon me. I will lay open Lord Reuven's villainy to him, and I know his noble nature too well to fear a continuance of his anger. Here, therefore, will we part for a while, 
and when we meet again, I trust all obstacles to our happiness will be removed. Be faithful. Though many your work and eclat hill should rise betwixt us twain, and many an envious dream and will run babbling to the main. This fond and faithful heart believe however apart we be. Though in my breast it seem to heave, will linger still with thee. Thus when the silver lamp of night sails through the quiet sky and sheds its last pure and bright upon the traveller's eye. To glide wherever he roam, its faithful light as sweetly beams upon his distant home. McSwill sings without left. Soft, who comes here? By his gate it should be McSwill, the Baron's toping henchman. They retire up. Enter McSwill, left. My master's gone mad. There's a pretty job. If he had been going to be married instead of the Earl, I shouldn't have wondered so much. But for an old man to go mad, who can sit and drink all day without anyone to snub him for it, is the most ridiculous thing that ever came under my observation. Old Mother Bridget never lets me drink in quiet at home, so I carry a pocket pistol about with me. Pulls out a flask. Now, this is what I call my young man's best companion. It's a great consolation on an art excursion. To one who has so respectful a belief in bogies and warlocks as I have, whiskey is the only spirit I feel a wish to be intimately acquainted with. Robert, advancing and slapping him on the shoulder. McSwill? McSwill, dropping on his knees. Oh, Lord, what's that? Why, how now, booby? Where have you been at this time of night? Eh, uh, what, well, Robert, is it only you? I w was just kneeling to... Uh, this stupid latchet, you see, is... Pretending to fasten it. Ah, oh, yes, I see. But where have you been, I ask you? Been? Oh, I've been for Father Francis. My lord's gone crazy and the Earl of Marsden sent me. The Earl, the Earl of Marsden? Marsden. <laughs> What's in the wind there? The Earl of Marsden sent you? Yes, to be sure. He's in the castle there and just going to be married to my Lady Margaret. Fool. The Earl of Marsden is dead. Nay, now you're mad. My master's been telling the same story this half hour. But the Earl says it's no such thing. That he is not dead, never was dead. 
that my master's out of his wits, and off he sends me for Father Francis to come and talk to my master and marry my mistress. What mystery is this? There is some foul play towards. At any rate, the Lady Margaret must know her danger. Is the friar gone? Oh, yes, he's there before now. The very name of a wedding made him chuckle and waddle off at a rate which obliged me to stop so many times for refreshment that he has been out of sight these some minutes. Let us haste, father. We may foil the villain yet. Exeunt Robert, Andrew, and Effie right. It appears there is something wrong, but I can't positively pretend to say what it is. It is my flask seems as much exhausted as my speculations. Mm, I'll make the best of my way home, and ruminate how much whisky I shall drink at the wedding. Faith, I'll away to the bridal, for I will be tippling there, for my lady's about to be married, through whom I don't know and don't care, but I know we shall all be as frisky, and tipsy as pipers, good luck, and so that there's plenty of whisky, she may marry the devil for Max. So, faith, I'll away to the bridal, for they will be tippling there, for my lady's about to be married, to whom I don't know and don't care. I once left the bottle for Cupid, and bailed in the juice of my glass. I simmered inside and looked stupid, and caught at a cherry cheek glass. She turned out a jilt where a lie should I say that it gave me no pain, for sorry it made me so dry that I took to my bottle again. So, faith all away to the bridal, for they will be tippling there, for my lady's about to be married, to whom I don't know and don't care. They say there's five reasons for drinking, but more I am sure may be got, for I never can find out by thinking a reason why people should not. I stick that I'll not scruple at giving, I'll name it while tis in my head. Tis if you don't drink while you're living, you never will after you're dead. So, faith all away to the bridal, for they will be tippling there, for my lady's about to be married, to whom I don't know and don't care. Exit McSwell, right. Scene 4. The Chapel. A large gothic window, through which the moon is seen going down. Music. Lord Riven, priests, vassals, etc., discovered. All is prepared. O'er the great fiend once more I triumph. Ere yon orb shall kiss the wave, the tributary victim shall be paid. Bow, ye less subtle spirits, Bow abashed before your master. Margaret! Tis Riven calls thee. Hasten, sweet, and crown thy lover's happiness. Enter Lady Margaret and Bridget right. Lady, to the altar. I follow you, my lord, and yet... Riven, impatiently seizing her hand. Come, Margaret, come! Distant thunder, a loud gust of wind, shakes the casement. What noise was that? Tis but the wind, my lady. We shall have another storm, I think, when the moon sets. When the moon sets? Ah, oh, my poor father! See, twill set soon, my Ruthven. Let me again beseech you to delay till then the ceremony. Nay, this is folly, Margaret. Father, commence the rites. Enter Lord Ronald, preceded by Robert, and followed by Andrew, Effie, and attendants, right. Make way, make way, I say. Lord Ronald shall be heard. My daughter, my daughter. Riven aside. Confusion. Ronald. Where is she? Give me my daughter. My dearest father, be calm. What wouldst thou with me? Ha! Do I again embrace thee? Follow him not. He dragged you to the tomb. Margaret, we are waited for. Barbarian, I forbid the ceremony. You have no right over her. I am her father. You are. You are my loving, tender father. I will not wed against his will. Throwing herself into his arms. I'll hear no more. She is my bride betrothed. This madman would deprive me of her. No. Why this violence? Wait till the hour is past. Will you listen to his ravings? I do not rave. Loud thunder. Another gust of wind blows open the casement. See, see, the moon already rests upon the wave. One moment, but one moment. 
detaining Margaret. Nay, then thus I seal thy lips and seize my bride. Riven draws his poniard and rushes on Ronald. Lady Margaret shrieks when Robert throws himself between Riven and Ronald and wrenches the dagger from his grasp. Hold, hold, I am thine, the moon has set. And I am lost. A terrific peal of thunder is heard. Unda and Ariel appear. A thunderbolt strikes Riven, who immediately vanishes through the ground. General Picture Curtain End of The Vampire or The Bride of the Isles by James Planchet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.